So I want to uh, report on recent work on a somewhat unexpected connection, namely a connection between renormalization and the C star algebraic formulation of random field theory. This is based on uh, several papers together with Detlef Buchholz, which appeared in the last two years, and, uh, and also on work in progress with Romeo Brunetti, Michael Dutsch, and Kasia Reisner. And I think Kasia will tomorrow also report on aspects of this work. Um, let me see. Okay. Ah. Okay, so uh, when one um, constructs interacting renormalized quantum field theory in the perturbative approach, then it's uh, very convenient to do this uh, in the way of con uh, as a construction of time ordered products of composite local fields of a free theory. This is an, a rather old approach. Uh, I think first steps were done by Stückelberg and also Bogle Jubov uh, proposed it. And it was then mathematically analyzed in large detail and uh, really mathematically rigorous way by Epstein and Glaser. And was more recently generalized to quantum field theory on curved space times. And I think the structure is now quite well understood. The basic object in this study is the S matrix, but the S matrix is here considered as a generating functional of time ordered functions. So it's a formal power series. So, so we take the exponential, the time ordered product of uh, n, uh, n such uh, fields and uh, forms the uh, exponential series. And this exponential, this time ordered product, n order time ordered product, is just defined in terms of the local structure of these fields. So this uh, sh should be the function of the underlying field at a given point, space time point x1. And then you uh, order these functionals according to the time coordinate and integrate over space and time. So formally, this is a very simple expression. The difficulty is, I think this is similar to the problem discussed in the previous talk, is that these products are in many cases ill-defined. The reason is here that these fields are operator value distributions and you are allowed to multiply them with test functions, but time ordering contains step functions and so you uh, introduce some singularities and so the expression as a sense is not meaningful. Now it's nowadays uh, uh, known how to, how to do this and the very, this Epstein-Glaser method is very elegant uh, to, to perform this construction, namely you uh, can put certain characterize these time ordered products by certain axioms and by these axioms these uh, uh, time order products are um, fixed up to some renormalization freedom and this renormalization freedom can be characterized by the so-called main theorem of renormalization, which is due to Stora and Popino. Uh, and the content is the following. You have compared two different choices of time ordered functions. And then you can prove that two different choices, which satisfy these Epstein-Glaser axioms, are related by a renormalization group transformation Z. And Z is just a map which maps local composite fields to each other such that the corresponding S matrices are related. So S hat is this new S matrix with a new definition of time order product 
S is the original one, and they are, they are related by just relabeling the entries by this map Z. And uh, so this is an, uh, uh, characterizes these uh, possible renormalizations completely. And one can also formulate the dynamical law for this in terms of this series. This is the uh, well known Schwinger Dyson equation. And I wrote it here for the example of a scalar field. So I have the n plus first order time order product, and I insert for one entry the Klein Gordon operator, uh, plus m squared applied to phi, and in the, on the other side, you would take just the functional derivative of this uh, functional capital F with respect to the underlying field. Okay, so this is quite standard. The question one can ask, is it possible to go beyond the construction via formal power series? Because here, if we just construct these formal power series, there are a few cases where you know something about the convergence of the formal power series. There are also results on divergence of the formal power series and it, in more realistic quantum field theory, it seems to be hopeless to get convergence. Now, uh, there are of course several approaches to construct quantum field theory beyond formal power series, for instance, constructive quantum field theory. This was successful for uh, models in two dimensions and a few models in three dimensions, but not yet in four dimensions. And uh, the difficulties are really heavy in, uh, if you want to go beyond the uh, constructions which uh, apply to these lower dimensional field theories. Um, then there are other constructions in cases where your theory has higher symmetries, for instance, conformal symmetry in particular in two dimensions allows a lot of explicit constructions. Integrability is another structure which uh, can be used to, to, to construct models. Now here, I want to discuss a new ansatz, which is uh, the fact that these uh, formal power series generating these S matrices are unitary elements of some star algebra. So the question is, can one just look at the, the abstract C star algebra, which is generated by these unitaries, and what is the structure of this abstract C star algebra? The problem is that in perturbation theory, you formulate usually things in terms of uh, operator value distributions, and these operator value distributions are unbounded Hilbert space operators. And uh, so there are a lot of technical problems and you're very far from the usual formalism of C star algebras. But uh, so the goal would be to reformulate the axioms of perturbation theory in terms of relation between these unitaries. And uh, this can be done to some extent. Uh, there are essentially two algebraic properties which are needed. The first is well known, this is causal factorization. What is causal factorization? So it's just the definition of time ordered product that the time ordered product coincides with the usual operator product if the arguments are time ordered. And I wrote this here in the case of a case order time ordered product with the nth order time ordered product, and I get the k plus nth order tens, uh, time ordered product, provided the arguments of the first k factors, the x1 to xk, are not in the past of the uh, uh, points y1 to yn. 
So if you have a proper time ordering, then this is the request. And then you uh, insert this uh, factorization into the formula for the S matrix. You just get this product rule for the S matrix. That's S of F times S of G is S of F plus G provided the support of F does not intersect the paths of the support of G. Now, this is actually the starting point of epstein glaser renormalization, namely this factorization yields an inductive construction of time-ordered products up to coinciding points. Again, very similar to what was discussed in the previous talk. There you can construct things for non-coinciding points directly, and the only problem is at coinciding points. And here you uh, have, in the first step, you construct the uh, time order products up to coinciding points, then you have to extend them. And this is what is the usual ultraviolet renormalization. And uh, if you use the standard structure of field theory, at the end, you can reduce this to a problem in distribution theory, which can be completely solved. So this is uh, uh, very satisfactory. Now, uh, we need a little bit more structure. Um, and th this leads to a somewhat stronger form of this causal factorization. Namely, we could also imagine that we have a given interaction, here capital G, and we split it in two parts along, uh, uh, across some Cauchy surface, so G plus is a part of the interaction which takes place after this Cauchy, in the future of the Cauchy surface, and G minus in the past. Of course, then there's this problem that the two supports uh, touch each other at the Cauchy surface. So, um, because uh, we deal here with distributions, we uh, get something which is not, not well defined. But let's for a moment uh, uh, assume that we can, can do this split. Then we take two other functionals, capital F and capital H, which are separated by the Cauchy surface, so the, such that capital F is in the future and capital H is in the past of the Cauchy surface. And then we look at the S matrix associated to this sum of the three interactions, F, G plus H, and we split now G in the way I described before. And then the whole S matrix would split into such a product. S of F plus G plus times S of G minus plus H. Now I insert uh, just uh, one in between these two factors and multiply them in a different way together. And I get the relation S of F plus G times S of G to the minus one times S of G plus H. And now I get a well-defined expression in the, of course, in the sense of formal power series. And the equality of these two, uh, two sides, which is written here, I call the causal factorization. So this is a meaningful relation. And in fact, in perturbation theory, it is not more gen as it's equivalent to the simple factorization relation I discussed before. Because when you do an expansion into these time order products, you can see that uh, this relation, causal factorization, follows from the other one. But uh, when, you, uh, when you don't have an expansion into a formal power series, then this is a stronger condition and has to be assumed as an axiom. But it's, uh, for, for the following, it's extremely important to have this stronger version of the causal factorization relation. Now, uh, we have the problem to characterize the dynamics in terms of the S matrix. 
Now, uh, this looks difficult because when you look at the Schwinger Dyson uh, equation, you have these, um, these um, uh, differential equations. And so it's not so clear how to um, formulate this directly in terms of S matrices, but this can be done. And this is the following. So we have the field equation uh, defined in terms of a Lagrangian as a functional derivative of the action. And here to get to this uh, unitary version of the Schwinger Dyson equation, we replace the field equation by a difference equation. So we look at the Lagrangian, they shift the field by adding some uh, field configuration psi and look at the difference. And psi is assumed to be a test function with uh, compact support. So this difference has compact support and one can form the integral. And I can do this with also with these other interaction terms. So this is uh, interaction term capital F shifted by adding this uh, compactly supported field configuration to the field configuration phi and get a shifted interaction. And then the postulate is that one obtains a new equation, namely that S of F is equal to S of F index psi plus delta psi L. Now, uh, can one, how can one justify this relation? Actually, one can take the derivative of this relation and sees that this directly produces the schwinger dyson equation. Actually, one can even prove that in perturbation theory that it's equivalent to the schwinger dyson equation. So this is a good justification for this formula. And other justification can be obtained by a path integral uh, uh, formulation of quantum field theory. There, uh, let me go back. Uh, there, this kind of relation can be formally understood as a, a translation invariance of the path integral. So you use, uh, you write the path integral as an integral of the field space, and you uh, think that your integral over all fields uh, is as a Lebesgue integral translation invariant, and then you get such, a, such an equality. So this, uh, these are justifications for these formulas, but uh, I think the more, more sound uh, justification comes from this uh, equality, uh, equivalence of this condition to the Schwinger Dyson equation in perturbation theory. Now, the nice aspect is that automatically you can now also construct the S matrices for other Lagrangians. So, here we uh, first do it for the free Lagrangian, but we can add these interactions capital F or capital G to the action and get a new, new theory. And this uh, is the formula which is uh, original uh, due to Bogle Lubov. So we want to add capital, an interaction capital F to given given uh, action, and we construct the retarded uh, S matrices for this new action just by this formula. So you multiply by S of F to the minus one times S of F plus G, and you can do it uh, in this way, or you can do it in the other way uh, from the, from the um, this, uh, causal factorization relation, you see that this uh, retarded interaction uh, does not see the interaction in the future of capital G, and the advanced interaction 
the, the advance S matrix of G does not see the interaction in the past of the support of G. Um, and then you can prove that these uh, relative S matrices satisfy again this condition of causal factorization. And they satisfy also this dynamical relation, but now for the new action. So in a sense, you have constructed not only one theory, but you have constructed all theories which you can obtain from one theory by adding these interaction terms. Here at the moment, there is still a restriction. Namely, we restrict ourselves here to interactions with compact support because if we want that these uh, contributions to the S matrices are well defined, uh, this uh, interaction should be restricted to some uh, finitely extended region in space time. But as I said, this retarded interaction is completely uh, uh, invariant under changes of the interaction in the future. And the advanced interaction is completely invariant under changes of the interaction in the past. So when you have an interaction which is, say, uh, uh, extended over all of space time, you just split it in two terms. One which uh, takes place, uh, which is uh, extended in the future, but not in the past, and the other in the opposite way. And you, then you can combine this retarded and advanced S matrices in a certain way, and you get the uh, S matrices for the new interaction from uh, that this new interaction uh, can be non-zero everywhere. This is uh, called the algebraic adiabatic limit. Just tells you that within this uh, formalism, you can construct uh, all these all these different quantum field series. Okay, now. I have a formulation of this axiom in terms of these S matrices. And because these S matrices are unitaries, I can try to understand the structure of the generated C star algebra. So I look at the, uh, these uh, operators S consider them as abstract element of some, consider the free group generated by them. I have certain relations, this relation causal factorization and dynamics, this defines me a certain group. Then I look at the corresponding C star algebra generated by this group, and this is a well-defined concept. This works for any region of space-time, and in this way, we obtain a Hakastler net of local C star algebras. So for any region O of space time, we build a C star algebra, which we call A of O. And this is generated by the S matrices S of F, as the support of F is contained in O. And it's now relatively easy to see that this association of uh, uh, regions to C algebra satisfy the Hakastler axioms. So you see immediately that uh, when O1 is contained in O2, then the corresponding algebras contain each other. From causal factorization, we get that if two regions are space like separated, that then the commutator has to vanish just because in the causal separation, let me, uh, no. Oh yeah, in this relation here, uh, you see when, this condition, when F and G have space-like separated support, then 
uh, you uh, you have not only that S of F times S of G is S of F plus G, but also the opposite relation. So you get automatically commutativity. So the local commutativity is automatically satisfied. And moreover, you have also a covariance, namely assume that G is a symmetry of the space time. Then there exists isomorphisms of this algebra such that uh, the, this uh, uh, isomorphism alpha G uh, if you, uh, for the region O2, restricted to O1, if O1 is part of O2, it's just the, uh, the automorphism on O1, and you have this law of composition. And uh, okay, this uh, holds provided the Lagrangian is invariant under the space time symmetry. Okay. So, in a sense, it looks nice. We have constructed quantum field theory for quite a general class of, uh, of interactions. So, we can claim that we solved a problem which was unsolved for uh, several, uh, several decades. But uh, unfortunately, the situation is not, um, uh, it's a little bit uh, less good. So, um, what is missing from a, so that we can call it a construction of the theory? So um, one, one can uh, play with this relation and see what one can, can find out. So first thing one can observe is that when we take the free Lagrangian, then one can actually uh, prove from the relations that the S matrices of linear fields generate the Weyl algebra. So we did not, we do not need to impose canonical commutation relations. The canonical commutation relations are already contained in our axioms and they are contained already in the Weyl form. So in the form of unitaries, not in the usual uh, form for the fields itself. So from the technical point of view, this is much, much nicer. Another result is, uh, this is a, a special model in two dimensions. Uh, we look at the free massless field and the free massless field in two dimensions uh, is known not to have a vacuum representation but there are representations of this um, massless field in two dimensions and uh, uh, very convenient representations due to Dereshinsky and Meissner. So it's a representation which one could call it an um, uh, uh, infra-vacuum representation. So it's, the vacuum is not really uh, in this representation, but there are states which are almost vacuum-like in this representation. In this representation, one can uh, construct these S matrices really as operators. And in particular, not only for the field itself, these are the well-known vertex operators, but one can also construct the S matrix corresponding to cosine and uh, sine function and also linear combination of them. And uh, then uh, these S matrices satisfy then all these conditions that can construct in this way the algebra of observables of the Sangorn model. This was done in a joint paper with Dorothea Barnes and Kasia Weissner. Uh, the third thing I uh, want to mention is um, uh, recent work together with uh, Detlef Buchholz. So one can look at the usual Fock representation of the Weyl algebra in the vacuum. Uh, so the usual free field representation of the Weyl algebra. And one can ask whether one can extend this representation at least to quadratic fields like phi squared or uh, d phi squared. 
And uh, this can be done. Actually, the interesting aspect of this work is when you apply this not only to the field phi squared, but also to the derivatives, you get, you get uh, um, modifications of the kinetic part of the, of the Lagrangian, which means that you look at a theory with a different space-time metric. And so it's because the space-time metric influences the, the causal uh, um, uh, commutation relations. It's clear that this cannot be obtained in perturbation theory. So the construction of these S matrices for these quadratic terms goes already beyond perturbation theory, but it can be done. And this was part of this, uh, this uh, statement. So there is some hope that you can do more in this approach than what has been done before. On the other hand, uh, from the point of physics, one would of course like to have more general interactions. Okay, now I come to the connection to renormalization. Actually, this is uh, now uh, something which is work in progress, and uh, we have, have not many uh, results at the moment, but I can say, say uh, uh, discuss what are the problems. And where renormalization uh, appears in this framework. So we start uh, by some reducible representation of the Weyl algebra on some Hilbert space, say the vacuum representation. <clears throat> now let's assume that we can extend this representation to the full algebra. Call this extension pi tilde. This is not clear that such an extension exists. And, but, Provided it exists, it's certainly not unique because you can look at automorphisms of the algebra, which act trivial on the Weyl algebra, but are not trivial on the full algebra. And then you can compare the representation pi tilde composed with alpha with pi tilde. And because pi, uh, pi tilde uh, because alpha is trivial on the Weyl algebra, uh, and the Weyl algebra is irreducible, uh, irreducibly represented, um, there cannot be a unitary implementation of uh, these uh, in, uh, automorphisms alpha in this representation. So uh, we, we see directly that um, there is some freedom in, ex in the extension, and actually the postulate is that this freedom is related to the renormalization group. There is no proof at the moment, but the, uh, uh, we would like to postulate that all such automorphisms, so automorphisms which are trivial on the Weyl algebra, are of the form of a renormalization group transformation. So, and you, by the requirement that alpha is an automorphism. You can see that this map Z has to satisfy certain condition, should, should map zero to zero, should again be a local field, the support should not change, and it should satisfy um, some relation which corresponds to the factorization relation, namely you require this form of additivity so Z of F plus G plus H is Z of F plus G minus Z of G plus Z of G plus H, provided the supports of F and H are, have empty, uh, empty intersection. And then there is a condition which uh, um, is related to this dynamical relation. So when we apply Z to this uh, object F Psi plus Delta L of Psi, you can, Replaces it by, uh, replaces by Z of F shifted by Psi plus Delta L of Psi. And moreover, Z should act trivially 
on the linear field itself, <coughs> which is this last solution. And the motivation for this axiom comes, of course, from the uh, 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 main theorem on renormalization of Stora Popino and uh, the the hope would be that one can can uh, find an argument which is uh, similar to the Stora Popino argument, but at the moment it's not clear how to find it, and um, yeah, one, ha one has to wait. But on the other hand, I think. As a postulate, this looks, uh, in my opinion, uh, interesting and uh, also plausible. Now, uh, there is an interesting relation to symmetries. Let G be an invertible affine transformation on the field space. So transformation which shifts the field on, and uh, makes a linear transformation on the field, which is particularly interesting is a field has many components. And in this uh, map should be such that local functionals are mapped to local functionals. And I call it, so, so G star is just a push forward of the functional capital F. And let's assume that the Lagrangian is invariant. Then we can define an automorphism of the algebra, which is just induced by this map G. Namely, alpha G applied to S of F is just mapped into S of G star F. Okay, now assume that the, uh, this automorphism on the vial algebra is implemented, unitarily implemented. Then we can look at this combination, a joint action of U of G times the inverse of this automorphism alpha G. And this acts trivially on the Weyl algebra. And therefore, uh, according to the postulate, this, the whole effect must be a renormalization group transformation, which then depends on G. And what one then can show is that this uh, map from G into the renormalization group, the G and Z of G, satisfies a certain co-cycle relation, which is very no well known from perturbation theory. And so the question of symmetries are respected, can be discussed in the same way as one usually does it in perturbation theory. And if one would assume in addition that Z is infinitely differentiable and could just do the same analysis in, in, uh, as in perturbation theory. But at the moment, no results are available if you go beyond perturbation theory on the possible non-triviality of these score cycles, which would mean whether there are anomalies or not. Okay, so I come to a short outlook. So I have <clears throat> um, show, um, told about algebraic structures of formal perturbation theory and have uh, discussed how they induce a construction of quantum field series in terms of C-star algebras. Now, a nice aspect of this construction is that we have, uh, in a way, we can talk about a quantum field theory uh, so the quantum field theory in some sense already exists. We don't have to define it by a construction procedure, but we already have it. Of course, we would like to have a quantum field series with certain properties, but this would mean that we uh, just analyze these uh, um, Hakasler net of C-star algebras which we have constructed. Then we have a new aspect of symmetry. So we see that there's a non-perturbative aspect and uh, one can try to, to find out what one uh, can, can say about this non-perturbative aspect. The formalism was developed for scalar field. 
So the question is, uh, can it be generalized to more uh, other fields, for instance, to Fermi fields? This seems to be possible without uh, much changes. Uh, gauge series are a little bit more complicated and at the moment it's not so clear how to do this. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. So that's what I wanted to tell. Thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you so much. So lots of stimulating questions come out of this talk. Are there um, questions from the audience? No urgent questions? Um, yes? Someone is wanting to say something? Uh, so if there's no urgent question, I'd like you to go back, if you don't mind, to this anomaly uh, uh, issue you pointed out in the previous slide. You went fast. Could you just comment on this? Uh, and uh, saying what kind of anomaly you expect there with the non-triviality of the co-cycle? Yeah, uh, so, so um, okay, Le let's look at the example of a scalar field. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, take a um, complex scalar field, so you have this global gauge invariance, Mm -hmm. multiplying with a phase, and you expect that there's no anomaly. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you would expect that you can f find that this co cycle is then trivial. Mm. Um, there are, but there's another typical example, namely the, the um, scale, uh, the, the scale transformations. So yes. you have a massless free field, then you have this, uh, for the free field, the scale uh, um, transformation as a symmetry. So this would be implemented on the Weyl algebra unitarily. But we know that it, uh, for in perturbation theory, that you are, there are anomalies if you want to extend it, for instance, to the Wick squared or to other composite fields. Yeah. And so this would be an example of an anomaly. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are also anomalies uh, which people formally derive in the pass integral, uh, which are not perturbative. Yeah, that's why I was asking, yes. Yeah, yeah. So this would be interesting, but uh, at the moment we cannot say something about this. So this is just a, uh, say, say, um, a frame in which you could ask these questions, but um, the work has still to be done. Okay, thank you. Any other question, comment? Yes, please. David? Uh, so Klaus, my, my question goes back a long way to 1966 when George Mackey was the Eastman visiting professor at my college in Oxford. And I went to a, a talk of his and he made a rather strong prediction. He said, well, the next 10 years, C star algebras will become part of the working toolkit of practical quantum field theorists. And I was very young and very impressionable and went off at least to try and understand what Banach space was. Um, now that's not actually happened. What, what, what's happened is that in perturbation theory, whilst you may object to the mathematics of what we're doing, we're getting good fits to uh, particle physics phenomenology and our, and our lattice gauge uh, people with all sorts of problems of boundary conditions uh, uh, have some handle on the non-perturbative. So um, we're now 50 years after George's uh, prediction. Do you think there will still be a future for C-star algebras in doing practical calculations? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, okay, I think uh, So in any case, these sister algebras are there. Yeah. So, so you you have this structure. This structure is just there. And the question is how much you can learn from it, how much you can get from it. And um, 
yeah, so I think that one has to wait for this. So, so there are few first uh, results which seem to be encouraging, but of course the future has to show how far one can go. And so it's a frame in which you can ask new questions. And okay, I mentioned this uh, this one point, which was this. Uh, uh, where was it? No. Yeah, this, this point on the quadratic interactions. This is, of course, from the physics point, not very uh, exciting. On the other hand, it clearly goes beyond perturbation theory. Yes. So this is already an indication that perhaps you can do something. Actually, if you go to the arguments, they are rather cumbersome. It's not straightforward. There's a step which goes easy, but then there remains a phase to be determined which is usually uh, not done because uh, you consider these phases to be irrelevant. But in this framework, you should also compute the phases. And this turns out to be uh, rather complicated and is related already to, to these problems of renormalization. And uh, of course, it's related also to this problem that uh, perturbation theory cannot uh, converge. And, uh, and um, one can expect that this, uh, similar problems occur when you go beyond quadratic perturbations. Um, but, um, okay, at the moment we don't have more, yeah? So that's... Thank you.